Good afternoon, everybody. Um, Hugo Chavez and his legacy is the title of my talk. Uh, just as a matter of interest, who, who here is a supporter of the EFF? Good who, who, who's a supporter of the ANC? Okay, well, both, both of you are going to, both EFF and ANC are going to hear something that you like and also probably something that you don't like. Um, I, when I was asked to nominate a date, I thought I'd fix a date after the elections so we know the outcome of the election because a lot of what uh, I'm going to be talking about um, appeals to a certain mentality uh, as a solution to South Africa's problems and highlights another solution to South Africa's problems of dealing with poverty in particular. Um, I think that the policies followed by President Chavez are probably a lot closer to policies that are espoused by the EFF. And um, <coughs> the uh, policy alternatives uh, are probably a lot closer to what are espoused by the ANC. But let's take it off. <coughs> Go. Okay, hero or villain? So I think we. He's probably, uh, if one looks at his record, a bit of both. Next. What was his greatest success? So. Let's move on. Okay. Chavez's most enduring and positive legacy is his shattering of Venezuela's pe peaceful coexistence with poverty, inequality, and social exclusion. He wasn't the first political leader who placed the poor at the center of the national conversation, nor was he the first to use oil revenue to help the poor. But none of his predecessors did it so aggressively and with such a passionate sense of urgency. And no one was more successful in planting this priority into the nation's psyche. Moreover, his ability to make the poor feel that one of them was in charge has no precedent. I think that, to me, describes in a nutshell the power of what Hugo Chavez did and achieved in his 12 years in, uh, in office. I'm sorry, I'm just going to turn this telephone off so that it doesn't interfere with anything. He changed the debate in Venezuela forever. Uh, he was a person of extraordinary capability, a very clever man, an extraordinarily capable politician, and he was a game changer. He changed the nature of Venezuela's politics, as I say there forever. And there's a statement by Ambassador Milos Alcala, who was a former Deputy Foreign Minister of uh, Deputy Foreign Minister under uh, Hugo Chavez. He was a former ambassador with me in Israel at the time that I was there, and uh, also a permanent representative of um, Venezuela to the United Nations. And he, in fact, ended up, as many of um, President Chavez's supporters did, ended up parting company with him and going into the opposition over issues relating to human rights and breaches of what uh, many of his critics regard uh, as um, breaks with a commitment to democratic values. The tendency to make poverty and inequality the central theme of our politics is irreversible. The old days will never return. <coughs> the colours of Chavez are everywhere today, both in the government and in the opposition. No one can win an election in this country without adopting his unswerving commitment to that conviction. And I think that's a very important statement for, for a simple reason. Because I think what it says is something about South Africa. There is no party that participates in elections in this country that can win an election without adopting an unswerving commitment to the need to address poverty and inequality in our society. So, if one looks at the results of the, the election last week, and you see the huge mandate that has been won by the ANC, it's because people believe that that is part of the ANC's commitment. So the, 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 the thinking that one sees, uh, and that I saw in, in, in Venezuela when I was, was there, 
is something which has a, a, a lot of resonance in our politics in South Africa. No one, not even his harshest critics, can say that the Chavez did no good. However, the Chavez legacy is one of good and bad. Why do I say this? Okay. If we look at what he uh, accomplished, firstly, he didn't, contrary to what many people think, nationalize the oil industry in Venezuela. That was done by a predecessor of his in 1976. So he wasn't responsible for that at all. In fact, some of his critics to the left of him criticized him um, fiercely because he allowed uh, private investment back into the oil industry in, in Venezuela. Basically because the national oil company, PDVSA, uh, was used, its revenues were used to such an extent uh, for social welfare programs that in fact um, important investment in the national oil industry failed and the only way in which they could actually achieve the objectives of improving investment in the oil industry was by way of inviting oil companies who had been previous owners of, uh, of uh, oil exploration and the resources in Venezuela back into, uh, into the industry again. He was also not the first president to use the revenues of the national oil company PDVSA to support a, welfare, a social welfare system. That's a, a, a process that had been going on from the 70s. Um, so he wasn't first in that regard, but he was the first president in Venezuela's history to dedicate his rule for the perceived exclusive benefit of the poor. And he was quite, quite specific in that regard. The issue for him was about poverty and inequality, and he was unswerving in that commitment. The social welfare. He created a broad social welfare system in Venezuela, funded by all revenues, which aimed to do the following. Provide unemployment benefits, pensions and disability payments for all citizens. A free public health care system, subsidies for the construction of public housing, subsidies for, for public utilities, gasoline and food prices, and free public edu education at all levels. So that's something which I think university students would certainly like in this country, is free public education. Um, he created worker-owned cooperatives to act as a substitute for private sector corporations. Um, in the first half to two-thirds of his, uh, his presidency, these cooperatives worked well, but they became very dependent on state subsidies, and as the state subsidies declined, the worker cooperatives went into uh, decline, and many of them failed. He established grocery stores that would deliberately sell food below market value by use of subsidies to ensure an improved food basket for the poor. He nationalized telephone companies, electricity companies, cement production, food plants, coffee plants, farms, and banks. And all of those processes worked well initially, they're all in a state of crisis now because they've been dependent to a very large measure on state support. And uh, state support, as it's diminished, the cooperatives and these nationalizations have begun to fail. In fact, to such an extent that at the time that Chavez came to power in 1998, or the end of 1998, 1999, um, oil revenues accounted for approximately 77% of Venezuela's. Uh, national economy. By the time he died in 2012, um, oil was about 95% of Venezuela's economy. So one can see there that national production uh, in nationalized form declined <coughs> severely. And it in fact has contributed massively, for example, to a shortage of food in the country. They, they, they used to be a food exporter, now they're a net food importer, in fact, they import maize from South Africa. Um, the effects of his measures, the unequal distribution of wealth in Venezuela, dropped to among the lowest in the Americas during the 14 years of his tenure. <coughs> ECLAC, the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America, found that from 2002 to 2010, poverty in Venezuela was reduced by 20.8%, so impressive. Poverty fell from 48.6% to 27.8%, while extreme poverty decreased from 22% to 10.7%. 
Very impressive statistics. According to ECLAC, Venezuela has the lowest Gini coefficient at the moment in Latin America. So economic equality in the country is, is, is I wouldn't say been achieved, it certainly hasn't, because there's still very wealthy people in, Latin America, in, in, in Venezuela, but it has the most equal distribution of wealth of all Latin American countries. But according to World Bank, infant mortality, for example, fell from 20.3 uh, births per thousand when you came to power, to 12.9 by 20 billion, up to 12 years later. So one can see here that under his uh, governance, Social me measure of uh, social improvement in the country was 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 consistent and good. Um, policies that were implemented, he implemented a widespread national health care program for all Venezuelans, which is free of charge, through a program as, known as Barrio Adentro, uh, and this placed health clinics directly into poor communities where they got relatively sophisticated medical care, including very good eye care. Uh, it was very largely supported by the Cuban government who, as in South Africa, sent uh, doctors to Venezuela to, to support this program. He had public housing pro programs uh, that have moved millions of Venezuelans from shacks into permanent homes. And this is very important, and it's something that in South Africa we don't get right. Education was prioritized and made hugely, hugely more accessible. UNESCO figures indicate that the number of children enrolled in secondary education ro in, uh, rose from 48% in 1999 when he came to power to 72% in 2010. So again, you can see this massive uh, growth and commitment to access. I want to stress education because education, in fact, is the biggest single factor of production in a modern economy that makes a difference when one sees what earning power is for individuals, when one sees what the capacity of an economy becomes when you have a, a, an educated workforce, and it has the capacity when you apply it as a macro solution to change the character of an, an economy to move it from a, a, a middle uh, level mixed economy in which one has traditional economy together with, uh, uh, with modern economy as one has here in South Africa, Education is the single biggest factor that changes the character of, of your economy. So what they did there was they improved accessibility. And it's guaranteed by making schooling at primary and secondary level uh, for learners free. Thousands of primary and secondary schools have been newly built or refurbished. Now, impressive. Ten new universities are established in his 14 years of, of governance. And Venezuela now ranks fifth in the world for the number of students per head of population. A few countries, Canada, Singapore, a few others, are ahead of Venezuela. So th that is a very, very telling statistic. The cost of university education has been dramatically reduced to make higher education accessible even to the poorest families. And there's a, there's a nice statistic. The Chavez government made the monthly cost of university education cheaper than the monthly cost of a daily glass of orange juice. <laughs> okay? So, the most telling achievement of all of the Chavez era social programs, which brought housing and health care, food and education to the poor, was that they helped raise living standards of millions and inspired widespread and passionate support for President Chavez. So, he had a very passionate constituency, people are very involved in support. So if one sees somebody achieving so much good, why the intense criticism? Chavez policies are widely perceived to have had seriously negative consequences for Venezuela. Some of these the damaging consequences of the Chavez uh, era policies are discernible in the political, economic, and social makeup of Venezuela today. For example, shortages in the economy are severe. Um, the severe devaluation of the local currency, the Bolivar Fuerte, uh, has contributed to a very, very uh, high inflation rate. And there's growing social unrest in the country, um, which has led to the deaths of more than 40 people in recent street protests. And the crime rate in Venezuela is one of the highest in the world. Five most serious economic criticisms that are made 
both inside and outside, is that the diversification of the economy has been dramatically diminished due to an over-reliance on oil. So what has happened in Venezuela is a, is a, is a growth of phenomenon known as Dutch disease, because it happened for the first time in the Netherlands in the 1970s when they discovered oil and gas. Uh, you had the price of the local currency improving to such a, an extent to, to uh, the wealth that it generated. Um, local industries that were producing things other than oil started to collapse. And the result of that was uh, you then started to have unemployment, a decline in production of the non-oil economy, and an economy which became kind of a one-horse show. And uh, this is exactly what has happened in Venezuela. In 1998, oil revenues accounted for just over 75% of Venezuela's exports. Today, that figure stands at 95%. Venezuela <coughs> produces dramatically less and imports much more of its basic necessities into the and that includes maize from South Africa. Venezuela's national debt has soared, so despite being such a wealthy country, they're borrowing a lot. Uh, and it's gone up from 34 billion in 1998 to over 150 billion today. And disturbingly, oil production, which is what everything is based on, has declined from 3.2 million barrels a day to 2.5 million barrels a day due to the failure to invest in the oil producing infrastructure. So um, when you focus too much on uh, the, the, what the oil um, revenues can produce and you don't give enough attention to the infrastructure that produces it, you end up with this kind of, kind of situation. And one of the people who I met in Venezuela said to me that what's wrong here is Venezuela's always had oil. And he said, you know, in this country we're used to what the benefits of oil are. He said, in fact, there's a joke here. What is the difference between a good oil company and a bad oil company? And he said, it's four dollars. And he said, why? Because currently it takes around four dollars to get a barrel of oil out of the ground. And we can sell it for 108 or 109 dollars. So it's a very good business. If the company is doing badly, it costs eight dollars to get out of the ground. So he says, the difference between good and bad is four dollars. <laughs> so, <laughs> so from that point of view, what Venezuela has become, has become a country that is utterly dependent on its oil. And that's not a good thing. Uh, it's, it's, it's too much of a good thing because what it has done is it's damaged the rest of the economy. Um, and one starts to see this where Venezuela's inflation rates are sitting at around, around 60% now. Uh, it's the highest in the world at the moment. Um, Venezuela's currency, the Bolivar Fuerte, now reflects the widest margin between an official and black market rate in the world, a margin of around 7 to 1, which either makes Venezuela one of the most expensive or one of the cheapest places on earth to live in. So if you've got dollars and you go and change them on the black market, Venezuela is a very cheap place to be. But if you're going to pay at the official rate, it's one of the most expensive. I'll give you examples of this. A 50 litre tank of, of petrol costs the equivalent of one rand 50. Yes. Now, I mean, just think about this. What could you do if you could fill your car or your motorcycle or whatever, your taxi, for one rand fifty. Well, here we're paying thirteen, fourteen, one rand fifty fills a tap. Uh, it's 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 not realistic. And 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 it's so unrealistic that what you have is you now have a massive black economy in Venezuela which smuggles oil. They buy petrol and they buy oil and they fill great big forty-four these big drums. And in the deep Amazon jungle, you see these indigenous people, the indigenous, they call them, um, the original people of, uh, of Venezuela, in their canoes with a great big Johnson 100 horsepower motor <laughs> with a huge big barrel of, of petrol or oil in it, tracking down the river into Colombia to go and sell it, where, of course, it's sold at the correct price. And these cars come back very wealthy. 
So, so you've, got, you've got that kind of... Na the other nasty side of this is that that kind of money contributes to Colombia's black economy, which is drugs. They buy cocaine, bring it back into Venezuela. So Venezuela has a problem with, uh, with drugs, quite a severe problem with drugs, which contributes to the high crime rate in Venezuela. I'll give you another example. A one-week trip to Miami from Caracas at the official currency rate with a foreign exchange allowance of $3,000. So you buy it at eight, and you can sell it at seven times the price, so around 56 or 60. Foreign exchange allowance of $3,000 used allows a Venezuelan to pay for his entire airfare to Miami to stay in a hotel for a week, pay all food and drink and for the last time. And by changing $500 on the black market, when he comes back at the end of the trip, he's able to pay for his whole trip. Wouldn't you like a trip like that? <laughs> hey? You've saved 3000 have a, you have a holiday paid for by your, uh, say you put the other 2500 in your pocket. The five most serious political criticisms. While, while Chavez improved the lot of the poor in Venezuela in the process, he deeply undermined uh, Venezuelan democracy and created a model of author authoritarianism in the country while ruthlessly dividing the, the society between those who supported him and those who opposed him. Opponents, all of them, were delegitimized. So, in Venezuela, there's no good opponent. They're bad people. So you can't run a democracy on that basis. <laughs> <laughs> you, you have to respect your opponents. Accusations that he adopted a dictatorial approach towards trade unions by allowing government control of the election of office bearers and running them as extensions of government. I wonder what Joseph Mutunjwa would think of, uh, of being told by the Minister of Labour what he must do, mustn't do. End the strike in, uh, in Rustenburg. Must end today or you're going to jail. Because that's what happens in Venezuela. If the, if the trade union leaders are often arrested if they lead strikes which the government doesn't approve of. And some of the fiercest critics of the, the, the Chavez government were trade union leaders. Five of the most serious political criticisms of the Chavez era, he ruled by legislative decree through a so-called lay habilitantes. Basically, it's a vote by the parliament of, 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 of Venezuela the National Assembly, which allows the President to issue decrees and make laws. So he doesn't have to go to Parliament, he can just issue a decree and basically uh, run the country as he pleases. And there are limits, the limits are, you know, the time that he's allowed to do it. But this was done repeatedly. He stacked the courts and arrested judges who didn't comply with his requirements. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, they just... Um, there's a, there's a very famous case of Judge Afioni. She was, a, she was an administrative judge uh, in, in Venezuela. There was a man, a prominent businessman, who was arrested, I think for smuggling or something. And um, he was brought before her. She found that the uh, arrest warrant didn't comply with the requirements of the law, so she released him. So President Chavez, when he saw this, he said, she must go to jail. So the police went and arrested her. For the next three years, she sat in jail. No legal process, no court ruled on her presence. And in fact, it became such a celebrated case that one of uh, uh, Chavez's greatest um, supporters, a man called Noam Chomsky, um, who is really on the, the, the left of, 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 of politics in, in the international sphere, broke with Chavez and called him a cruel man and a dictator. Um, he decimated the independent media in the country, which criticized him by withdrawing broadcasting licenses. You, you criticize the president? Well, can you imagine the SABC losing its license? Well, it wouldn't, but, you know, maybe it's E! News or somebody else. Um, and, important, you, you run a newspaper. You need an import permit to bring a newspaper. Newsprint. Well, you just don't get an import permit. So your newspaper runs out of paper. You can't sell a newspaper. 34 independent radio and TV stations were closed, and at the same time that this was happening,
10 new government stations, uh, so suddenly 10 new SABC stations overnight. Uh, these are some pictures that I took, um, basically because they tell a story, and they reflected um, some of what I saw. Now there's a picture, go back. There's a picture of Che, and it says uh, La Piedrita, which is uh, the name of the place. Al pasar no regresaremos jamás. This is the past. We will never return, ever. Hasta la victoria siempre. Onwards to the victory forever. Okay? So that reflects the revolutionary society in, in, and the revolutionary objectives in Venezuela. Next. But here what you see is um, a poster which at the stop says, Reconoce los pueblos, recognize them people. And then underneath it says to you, enemigos de la patria, enemies of the nation. Amredones del pueblo, people who steal food from the people. Sembradores de odio, sowers of hate. It's prohibited to forget who they are. And there they are with their pictures. So, I mean, this is the kind of the way in which the political debate is appropriated. You sit on the high ground, you use words like, uh, uh, they are sowers of hate, um, they steal from the food from the people. Those kinds of images are not good in a democratic society. Let's have a look at another one. Reconocelos, recognize them. La trilogia de man. The trilogy of evil. <laughs> now, these are people, these are members of parliament who sit in the National Assembly, but they oppose the president. And what do they say here? They keep that loose. They remove, they take away your electricity. They keep that la paz. They take away your peace. I can't see what the last one is. But it says, enough with the violence. Now, opposition in Parliament is described as violence. I find that quite sinister. And then, this is now a poster that goes up at election time. And what is it? It's a picture of Chavez's eyes. And he's everywhere. He's looking at you. He's watching how you, he's watching how you vote. So, so, so what kind of image does this present to people? who think they're going to have a free and fair vote. And then they find, here are the eyes. Now, what's significant about this is they had, a, they had a referendum, which was allowed by the constitution that he created in 2004. It was a recall vote, where if they get enough signatures, I think you have to get a million signatures, you can, you can, you can oblige the state to, or the IEC, to hold a recall election. So, we don't like Jacob Zuma, we say we've had enough of you, a million signatures and we can have another election. Okay? He won the election. And by the way, Hugo Chavez is the most re-elected politician in the modern history of Latin America. So he's a man who won election after election after election. But what they then did was after they held that, uh, that referendum. Every single person who signed the petition for his recall had their names published for everybody to know who they were. And anybody, anybody who had been a civil servant or a teacher or had worked for the National Oil Company or had held any kind of position that was a government-related uh, job lost their jobs. So, I mean, that sense of here I am, I'm watching you, is a very real presence when it comes to how you intimidate your opposition. This is why he was so roundly criticized as being an undemocratic leader. But he was winning elections. President Chavez is described by political scientists as a pioneer of one of the most, and one of the most adroit practitioners of a political strategy that is described as competitive authoritarianism. These are regi regimes where leaders gain power through democratic elections and then change the constitution and other laws to weaken checks and balances on the executive, thus ensuring the regime's continuity 
and its almost total autonomy while still retaining the patina of democratic legitimacy. So that's how he's seen by political scientists. So, but we've seen that he accomplished some quite extraordinary things in Venezuela. So this then brings us to the discussion of ends and means. Do the ends justify the, the means? Other than the undoubted impact which President Chavez had in creating a sense of complete social, political, and economic inclusion for the poor, did his rule comparatively achieve more than the efforts of other Latin American governments to improve the lot of the poor? One would imagine, yes. What's the answer? Next. The truth is, they didn't. So despite all that enormous wealth, the improvement in the lot of the poor in Latin America wasn't a unique phenomenon during this period in Latin America. And it wasn't exclusive only to Venezuela. Between 1995 and 2010, World Bank statistics show that over 40% of Latin America's population moved into a higher economic class. This substantial demographic shift led to more than 50 million people being added to those who are now categorized in, as middle class in Latin America. And according to the World Bank, Latin America is the only region currently in the world in which there is an, a narrowing of the inequality gap. So this phenomenon that, that Venezuela was part of is something that was repeating itself elsewhere in Latin America. What has caused this regional improvement? <coughs> the notable change was driven by the changed politics of the region, the so-called Pink Revolution, which saw a whole group of newly elected leftist political leaders coming to power in Latin America as a result of democratic elections in the 1990s. So, people like President Elwin in, in Chile. And uh, they saw an end to decades of military and right-wing authoritarian dictatorships, which had become the norm in the region. And newly elected politicians in countries as diverse as Chile, Brazil, Argentina, Peru, Panama, Colombia, Costa Rica, and Mexico all embarked on policies intended to promote sustained economic growth and engage in implementation of strategies to improve education and social services and ramped up efforts to increase the social wage, which is subsidies or grants paid to the poor, uh, through which policies were targeted uh, on redistribution to the poorest of society. So they were doing something that we know about in South Africa because this is a policy that's followed closely by the ANC. Okay? Results of this change. The expansionary policies implemented across the region resulted in sustained economic growth which saw Latin America's annual development improve by approximately 3.3% during the time that <coughs> President Chavez was in power up to, <laughs> and over the decade up to 2010. Venezuela's economy, by contrast, despite a 17-fold, <coughs> the price of oil improved 17 times while he was president. Venezuela's economy only grew at a rate of 2.8%. So regional-wide, it was 3.3%, <coughs> Venezuela was 2.8%. According to the UN's Economic Commission for Latin America, poverty-stricken households in the region as a whole dropped from 43.8% of regional population in 1999 to 29.9% in 2011. Not as impressive as, as Venezuela, but meaningful. If we could do that in South Africa, and I would suggest to you that we are well on the way to doing it because of government policies, um, I think that uh, you know, it makes a meaningful impact. A few standard examples such as Peru, Brazil, Panama, fared even better than Venezuela's remarkable turnaround under Chavez. Poverty rates in Peru in particular dropped from 54.7% in 2000 to 31.3% 11 years later. So, two-thirds of the population of, uh, well, one-third of the population of, uh, of Peru came out of, out of poverty in a little over a decade. Economic expansion and education are the key to the turnaround. Now, I mentioned at the beginning of this discussion the impact and importance in Venezuela of education. And this is a, uh, a thing that has been repeated all over Latin America. Education is the biggest single factor for the economic liberation of people. And it's demonstrated in Latin America. According to the World Bank, the basis of this remarkable macro trend through Latin America was not, as it was in Venezuela, the result of a single-minded radical redistribution of income, 
from resulting from record high oil prices, but rather it was a balanced combination of sustained economic growth at 3.3% over a period of 10 years, and the impact of dramatically improved education standards. Now, what is it about education <coughs> improvement that has this effect? Improved quality of education in a growing economy meant a better class of employment for people who are educated. If you're working with your mind and you're not working with your hands, you earn more. So if you've got pe people in the millions who are empowered with education, that it takes them into another class of employment. And the result of this is improved wage levels when you enter the labour market. Simply put, on a macro level, improved education meant improved wages. And that is on a, a scale of millions and tens of millions of people in Latin America. So education has proved to be the biggest force for economic liberation in Latin America. And what role in this for government? The role of government in leading and guiding these trends in Latin America has been crucial. And it's been based on sustained economic growth, policies to design uh, designed to deliver lower cost and better, better education to the nation, and most importantly, to create a social safety net in which government directs improvements in the social wage by making social grants available to the poorest sectors of society. There are 16 million people in South Africa who, in one form or another, receive social grants. That's meaningful. In fact, over the weekend, I was <coughs> at an air show in, uh, in China, and um, I met a former ambassador who I know very well, Zola Squia, who, in my view, as the former Minister of Social Welfare, probably single-handedly guaranteed the ANC's election victory this past, uh, this week. Because he's the man who, as Minister of Social Welfare, put the social ground system in place in South Africa. And that is what has improved the lives, particularly, of millions of people in rural areas where employment is poor, and where people, if they didn't have that kind of economic support, would be living very, very hard lives. Comparison with Chavez policies, when compared against these continent-wide improvements in the well-being of the poor, the policies followed by Chavez lose their luster. Why? They are demonstrated to be no more nor less effective than orthodox policies of promoting economic growth and well-being, followed by social democratic governments in the rest of the region. The big difference being that these region-wide policies, which had the same objectives as those of the Chavez government, came without the high social, political and economic price which Chavez had brought to Venezuela, particularly the process of dividing a society between rich and poor, naming your opponents as enemies. When you divide a society like that, you make social peace very difficult. And South Africa, with the kinds of divisions that we have in our society, we don't need policies which divide people. We have enough division in the society. We don't need to promote um, more division. We need to promote policies which bring about social inclusion, not uh, social exclusion, by naming opponents as enemies. The other approach followed in Brazil, Chile, Peru, and elsewhere in Latin America came without the widespread and widespread nationalizations of factories, industries, farms, shops and businesses which destroyed Venezuela's productive capacity outside of the oil sector and without the division of society into those supporting Chavism versus those who were characterized as the enemies of the poor. The voices of Chavez critics, both domestic and foreign, have to be considered in assessing his legacy, simply because a discussion about ends and means demands that the costs of achieving laudable social goals and his social goals were laudable, where they are the result of policies which severely divide a society, lead to accusations of growing authoritarian behavior by a government, and are seen to cause extensive social harm, as well as result in lasting economic damage, you have to assess the impact of those, uh, those outcomes. The biggest failing of the Chavez model, now this is with apologies to Ben Judah, author of The Fragile Empire, who was writing about Russia but I adapted what he wrote about Russia, eventually the money is going to run out. And then Venezuela leaders, as is happening now, are going to be forced to confront political and economic crises while trying to hold the country together.
Chavez looked strong, but his political mo and economic model is built on the one thing he never controlled, the price of oil. Questions? 